We are in Hebrews chapter 2, and uh, this is our artwork, just so you know. If you hadn't got one, you can get them out at the welcome desk out there and uh, keep it on your refrigerator, make it a bookmark in your Bible. And uh, uh, But we titled this year, I guess I titled it, I didn't ask anybody if I could or not, So, uh, but I titled it The Object of Our Faith because um, we gather here for a reason. I've already shared with you, we don't gather because we have to, we gather because we get to. And, and, and I honestly have this conversation on a fairly regular basis where people will say something along the lines of, well, I don't have to go to church to be a Christian. I go, you're right. You don't have to. But the fact is, when we're part of the family of God, the body of Christ, this gathering of saints or fellowship of believers, it should be that we want to gather. We want to come together for encouragement. We want to come together for the fellowship that we get to enjoy. We want to come together for the celebration of it all. I've always told folks, I mean, years ago when the gathering was first birthed, I said, you know what? If you show up on a Sunday and don't have fun, I don't blame you for not coming back. Because we want to come and enjoy our time together in this place of worship. And we want to be able to enjoy the people that were around. And I hope you take that chaos time when we say go and, 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 and greet people and say hi to people. And, and, and some folks that come in that are new and I say, look, just act like you've been here. Nobody will know the difference. It's okay. But we gather for the purpose of worship. And I've told you that the word worship uh, comes from this idea of worth-ship. We we gather to declare God's worth in our lives. He's important to us. It's important that we acknowledge and honor and exalt and and seek in our lives to bring Him glory. So this this idea of the object of our faith sounds like some sort of English lesson prepositional phrase or something. But the truth of it is is that uh, worshiping God is the focus of our lives. We don't just worship for an hour on Sunday. We worship every day, all day long. So you've really got to be challenged In the attitudes and choices and actions of your life, is my life a testimony of worship? Because it really draws down in the picture. We've got the the cross over here. We've got Christ in the clouds. And and that kind of is is where chapter 2 of Hebrews is going to be going. Because in chapter 1, we get this emphasis of the deity of Christ. And we see the name Christ used over and over again in chapter 1. And how how he, he is the message of God following the message that came through the prophets. And, and, and if, if you were a, a Hebrew reading this, you would understand that, that what God is revealing in chapter 1 is, is that all those things I said to you throughout Samuel and Psalms and Daniel and all the prophetic books were all pointing to Jesus. And they would understand the prophetic writings that, that, that David referenced through the Psalms and those kind of things. So they would understand that, that guess what, there is a Messiah. That there is, and, and from the Greek, after we get over into the New Testament, there is the Christos, the Christos, the Christ that would, would come and he would be the salvation of God's people. Then as we get into chapter 2, there's this warning to start out with, don't neglect, don't make light of the salvation that God has given you. So guess what? Congratulations, you're here. See, well, who am I preaching to? I'm actually preaching to the ones who aren't here. They might be on camera, I don't know. But anyway, so here's my point. The warning is, is don't take it lightly, what God has given us. Don't neglect the salvation. Really, that's not just this this salvation. Okay, great. I've got an insurance policy against hell. I get to go to heaven. Woo! No. Don't neglect Jesus in your life. Every day, acknowledge Jesus in your life. Every day, consider the fact that, that, that Jesus is our Savior, our Lord. And, and we're going to get into the conversation in chapter 2 where chapter 1 emphasizes the deity of the Christ, but it's chapter 2 that, that acknowledges and, and really highlights the humanity of Jesus. So, so after the warning in, in, in the beginning of chapter 2, then we get to chapter uh, verse 5. This is how it reads. It says, For he has not subjected to the angels the world to come that we're talking about. But someone somewhere has testified. What is man that you remember him? Or the son of man that you care for him? 
You made him lower than the angels for a short time. You crowned him with glory and honor and subjected everything under his feet. For in subjecting everything to him, he left nothing that is not subject to him. As it is, we do not yet see everything subjected to him. But we do see Jesus made lower than the angels for a short time so that by God's grace he might taste death for everyone, crowned with glory and honor because he suffered death. Let's pray together. God, we thank you. Thank you, God, that you have spoken to us. The, the, what we focused, what we concentrated on in chapter 1 was that you have spoken through your son, Jesus. You've spoken to us, and, and, and that which you have spoken to us is salvation and life and your love. And, and God, that you have, have spoken to us, as we'll see in this passage, your grace to us. God, help us to see it. God, help us to recognize it. God, help us to prioritize it in our lives and help us to live it. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, again, I, I started considering uh, as I was preparing for this morning, you know, all the things, all the gifts that have been given to me in my life. You know, I, I've shared a few of them, you know, the go-kart, the, you know, the wheelow, y'all like those kind of stories and things. And, and, and yet I, 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 you know, outside of Sunday school class and answering like a first grader, I started trying to consider what was the greatest thing, gift, anybody ever presented to me? What's the thing that I guess I would say, you know, I just appreciated the most in my life. And, and quite honestly, thinking back through the years, I couldn't name just one thing that I thought, man, that was just the greatest thing anybody ever gave to me, right? I mean, you know, we're, we're in, let's go ahead and say it, we're, we're sitting in church where we'd all say Jesus, right? That's the greatest gift I've ever been given. And then I started thinking in a different angle, what's the best thing that, that I could say anybody ever did for me? Right? The greatest thing that anybody ever said, here, I'm going to do this for you. You know, I mean, I can say for me, you know, uh, sometimes it might be a meal, right? Yeah, but now you can have a meal anytime. I'll tell y'all what the greatest gift that was ever done for me. All right, so so uh, about, mm, let's see, it would have been in uh, March of 1993, right? Uh, I, 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 Angie and I had been dating about six months, right? And we would talked about life and where we go from here and all that sort of thing. So I took her back to my home church, Cali Self Memorial Baptist Church in Greenwood, South Carolina. And and nobody was there, so I'd gotten the key from the pastor. It was it was the day it was March the eighteenth, nineteen ninety three. Uh, the day after uh, March 18th, it's the day after St. Patrick's Day. That's, I got memory for things like that. So we walked in, and the, the, the place was kind of all dark, moonlight, I guess, shining in from the windows and such. And so I, 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 we sat down on the front row, and, of course, I got down on one knee, and I said, Will you marry me? She said, Yes! <laughs> Man! All right, so in this life on this earth, greatest thing anybody ever did for me right there. That she said, yeah, she could have said, have you lost your mind? <laughs> I mean, she could have. She'd seen what a youth pastor does and all that sort of thing. It was like, oh, my. But I began to think, you know, when, when we're warned in chapter 2 not to take lightly, not to neglect, not to make small of or little of the salvation that God has given us, what is it that God has done for us? Now think about who we are first, all right? Because that's what this passage is, is going to deal with as we work into chapter 2. You know, God created everything we see. And then God created man, created woman, uh, breathed life into them, and gave them dominion over his creation. Right? What do you mean? He, he put his earth under the control of man, mankind. Right? And what did they do? What, what, what did they do? Okay, yeah, we can say they sinned, they failed. They rejected 
and rebelled against the God of this universe. Go ahead. What? I mean, think about it. All right. Let's say, you know, somebody's offering you this incredible opportunity and gift. What are you going to do? Spit in their face? Listen to these words. Because the warning is not to take it lightly. But then he says this, for he's not subjected to angels, the world to come. Now, <clears throat> so in, in the Old Testament, we see in Deuteronomy and other places that that the angels did have certain authority over cities and different things throughout the Old Testament. Angels were given some authority in, in God's creation, but angels have no authority over the world to come. The heavenly world, the heavenly kingdom, the spiritual world that, that, that God uh, it, it has already established, you see? And so, so when we see in the first chapter, God saying, all right, the Christ, the son, the heir, uh, all of those things. And then in, in chapter three, he says, do not forsake, do not neglect this salvation given to you for he is not subjected to the angels of the world to come. So, so there are a lot of people that like to wor worship creation. They like to worship the things of this earth. I mean, we see shrines around us all the time, don't we? I mean, every time I mention it on the island, you know, <laughs> people get mad at me. But where I came from in the mountains, people worship trees. And then I moved to the beach and people worship turtles. <laughs> I see, every time I mention that, people get mad at me. But anyhow, sorry. No, I'm not. All right. What is it that God intends to do with this creation that he gave uh, dominion of to mankind there, there will be the redemption of this creation as there will be a redemption of mankind and God will reunite both the created kingdom and the heavenly kingdom all right so he says for he's not subjected to angels the world to come that we're talking about but somewhere somewhere has testified and this is that comes from psalm 8 and it, it, these verses come from psalm 8 and it's not that god didn't know <coughs> who put it down but what he's saying he's not emphasizing who wrote it down he's emphasizing what he wrote what is man that you remember him this is the same man that spit in your face what is man or mankind that you would even think about him after what he did to you god after he rejected you, after he neglected you, after he rebelled against you, why would you even think about mankind? And then he invokes a messianic phrase when he says, or the son of man, that you care for him. God, in our rebellion, you still love us. You still care for us. Even when we rejected you, even when today, now guess what? Let, let's go ahead and, and make the commitment. Don't raise your hand because then it'd be bad. Everybody going to go out and be sinless today? Hmm, probably not, right? And yet, you see, that's what God's told us to be holy like he's holy. And we know yeah, we're part of this humanity that rebelled and rejected God, and so we're going to seek ourselves. And, and sin is this result of self, this desire for self. And that's what he's saying. He says, what is man that you would remember him or the son of man that you care for him? And then he says this, after the son of man reverence, he said, you made him lower than the angels for a short time. So, so, so God in his prophetic writing here in Psalms already telling us there's a time when we will be elevated above the angels, but the son of man, you made him lower than the angels for a short time. So the son of man, all right, so here we go. We're, 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 we're kind of looking back to chapter one, the Christ, the deity, God, the son was made lower as, as, as humanity. So he is fully God and fully man. You made him lower than the angels for a short time or, or you crowned him with glory and honor and subjected everything under his feet. So we see in this, this, this little Psalm 8 verses 4 to 6, we see this, 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 this acknowledgement that God is revealing to us that, that Christ on high left a place of glory to be made like us, but then he was restored to glory. You see, so the Son of God became the man. 
You see, humans were given this dominion over God's creation and we failed. So Christ became the man who would succeed in dominion and, and have everything subjected to him. The Christ, Christ, Jesus, he became human to do what humanity could not do. So when you see verse 7 there, you made him lower, a little lower for a little while, because we're going to see how this is, in, is translated from the Hebrew. Because if you go back and read uh, Psalm chapter 8, verses 4 to 6, you're going to see some different wording and stuff. And so, so remember, I've always said that translation is an art form, not an exact science. And so when you start to understand that the communication God is revealing right here is that the Christ became man. Fully man, subjected to the same things we're subjected to, and yet he succeeded where we cannot. But he succeeded on our behalf. And when we get on into chapter 2, we're going to see something there that, that it, it, it should be so dear to us that we wouldn't neglect or belittle or reject the salvation that God's given us. I mean, he goes on to the point where he says, you know, Jesus calls us brothers and sisters. I, I think that's one of the reasons, I, like, I, you know, some of you might have grown up in one of those churches where everybody was brother this and sister that, right? I think, I have to admit, you know, in seminary, you know, you'd walk down the hall in the dormitory or in the class building or whatever, and they'd go, hey, brother. And I always look at them and go, I don't know you. <laughs> it's almost an excuse not to know somebody's name, right? Hey, brother. Yeah, sorry, that's just me. But in Daniel chapter 7, we see this reference to the Son of Man. And in the vision, this messianic vision that Daniel has, he sees the Son of Man approaching the throne of God. Guess what? We can't approach the Son of God. The Son of Man is a reference to humanity. But the Son of Man in Daniel's vision is approaching the throne of God and is given dominion over everything in the universe. All right, so what we're seeing in Daniel 7 is this reference to the Son of Man who is, who is crowned with glory and honor and everything is subjected under his feet. I'm just, I, we, to understand what God is showing us in Hebrews is really important to understand. See, this is the way I've looked at it now. This is my Bible, all right? Well, this is my preaching Bible. I have many. But this is the one that stays right here all the time. There's an Old Testament. Oh, uh, let's see. I'll find the end of it here in a minute. It ends with that uh, Malachi book. Y'all know which one I'm talking about, right? That's, that's a very old preacher joke, but it talks about the Italian prophet Malachi. All right, that, that's the Old Testament right there, and that's the New Testament right there. Here's what I want y'all to realize. Hebrews is the binding that brings them together, the old and the new. The book of Hebrews is what explains all of Jesus in the Old Testament and reveals the fulfillment of God's promise of salvation in the New Testament. So when we're looking at this, we see all the prophecies of the Messiah. And then in Hebrews, we see God going, see, that I told you. I told you that's what I was going to do. I, I, I told you I was going to accomplish this. I told you this was going to happen. And then all of a sudden we see Jesus who was perfect in humanity, the perfect man. That's why I've always said there's no excuse to say I'm only human because the perfect human is Jesus. So that's, you can't say, well, I'm only human because the example of humanity is Christ himself. You see? So what is man's place? Man's place in creation is, yes, we, we were given dominion over God's creation and we failed. And so we are sub subject to a dominion that was handed off to Satan. Want to know why there's sin in the world? Here you go. Do what you want to. That's what was going on. So, so when we start to look at all this and we see this Son of Man reference, we know that Jesus, that's the term that Jesus used for himself most often, Son of Man, because he was emphasizing his own humanity as apart from his deity. And yet he could still say, be still. And the waves would listen to him. How about that? See? And then in verse 
The second part of verse 8, he says, For in subjecting everything to him, he left nothing that is not subject to him. As it is, we do not yet see everything subjected to him. So we don't see the redemption of creation. We don't see yet how God will reunite the spiritual and, and, and the earthly. As it is, we do not yet see everything subjected to him, but we do see Jesus. Now, in the book of Hebrews, this is the first time that the name Jesus is used. Because up till now, all we see is Christ. You know why? Because up till now, God has been emphasizing his deity, and now he's going to emphasize his humanity. And Jesus, which the name means God's salvation, you see, made lower than the angels for a short time so that by God's grace, he might taste death for everyone, <clears throat> crowned with glory and honor because he suffered death. Why? Because he suffered death for us, and then in the resurrection, he sat down at the right hand of majesty. God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit on the throne. So when I looked at this all week long, I kept thinking about the gift thing, and I kept seeing this, and I kept thinking, guess what? I grew up in a Christian home. A lot of you probably grew up in a Christian home. It might have been Baptist like me. It might have been Catholic. It might have been something else. So these are the things that you've heard most of your life, if not all of your life. And so it's not a grand leap for us to say, yes, Jesus was in heaven. Jesus came to earth as a man, and Jesus went back to heaven. Yay, I can believe that. But for some people, it's a huge leap to say, What? When God became a man? Well, that's what Hebrews is explaining throughout. That's what Hebrews is showing us. And then we're going to get over farther into Hebrews where we see where God really indicts the Jewish people to say, look, I offered to be your God and you rejected me. You see, mankind has rejected God over and over and over again. And so the warning of the beginning of chapter 2 is don't you reject the salvation God's given you. What are you going to do with that salvation today, y'all? I mean, when you leave this room, see, I told you, you already get a congratulations because you're here. But what will you do with that salvation when you walk out of here? Will you still live a life that acknowledges what God's done for you? You see? It's kind of funny. People give me stuff all the time. You know that? I remember... Um, I'll just share this little story because it's funny. How many how many of y'all live in Onslow County and know folks that go to Dixon High School? Right? And there's folks that go to Dixon. Jack used to coach up there, right? And then, then there's a lot of people at the gathering that have family and all that go to Topsail High School, right? Well, one Friday night, once upon a time, when I was uh, announcing football games at Dixon High School, man, I was picking on Topsail folks. I was giving them a hard time. Now, they were scoring a lot of touchdowns. I'll just, I'll admit that. So every time Dixon, I mean, Topsail would score a touchdown, I'd go, and it's a touchdown for the Topsail Pirates. Or, <laughs> and I was doing it in a microphone so everybody could hear it, right? And then when Dixon would do something, I'd bark really loud, right? Uh, so that Sunday morning, I walk into, into worship, right? And I, I'm stepping up onto the platform. And as I walk up onto the platform, right here, placed in a place of, you know, it was put in a place of prominence, was a Topsail Pirate ball cap. <laughs> it was a gift. Can I just, I mean, I don't have anything. I don't, I don't announce football games at Dixon anymore. Michael does. But... Uh, my confession is I have no idea where that hat is. <laughs> kind of tells you, I, I don't know that I actually, what, valued it very highly, right? You understand what I'm saying? I right, translate that a minute. You get out there in the world out there. Do you live the gift that God's actually given you? The salvation, the life, the abundance, the eternity that God's handed you? Or does it become something less than what it actually is? You see? Do you take it for granted? 
You see, God is showing us throughout the book of Hebrews, and, and, and we're doing the slow walk through Hebrews, and I'm not as good at it as some of the people I listen to and some of the people I read about it. But here's what I want you to know. The, the enormity of what God has done on our behalf cannot be minimized in the way we live our lives. To take this salvation that God has given us and to just kind of say, oh yeah, I'm a Christian, I got my card see and instead go out there and live like Jesus lives in you show the world Jesus you see that I grew up in a Christian home my mom and dad taught me Jesus my mom and dad prayed my mom and dad taught me to pray my mom and dad read the Bible to me. But I have to admit, it was really easy to come out of that home, to come out of the church I grew up in, and make very light of my faith. I mean, I'm just, uh, confession, ready? I'm just giving it to you. It's easy for us to put Jesus on the back burner in the world we live in. And for all that he did for us. And we go, well, what? He was God. What was a big deal to him? Yeah, you take the beating then. You hang on the cross then. Because that's what that we, he took death for us. That's why it says that. He said, but we do see Jesus made lower than the angels for a short time. So that by God's grace, because God gave us what we didn't deserve, he might taste death for everyone. He died in our place took our death I've told this story before and I've got just enough time to tell it again went to Columbia Bible College which is now called Columbia International University if you've heard this story just put your fingers in your ears I'll be done in a minute there was a trio they used to sing in chapel services man they had some of the greatest harmony three students and they would get up there and man they'd do acapella songs with trios and you know just this incredible harmony we all everybody knew who they were and all that sort of thing well well uh columbia bible college bordered the uh, broad river in columbia south carolina well, these three kids they love to hike and fish and do all that kind of stuff so they took it on themselves one time to 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 go down to the broad river and they crossed it a little shallow place to go over to the island that was kind of just offshore in the middle of the river to do some fishing and hanging out and that sort of thing and and they walked down the island a little ways and they were going to come back to the main shore down on the lower end of the island and it was deeper down there than it was at the northern the upper end of the island so they said well we'll just swim across so so they start swimming across and one of them was, was, was pretty much weaker than the others. He, he couldn't swim like they could. Man, those two, they were swimming, swimming. Look back, and their friend was not making it. And one of them knew he wasn't going to make it. So he turned around to go help him. And he helped him and pushed him and helped push him and pushed him and pushed him. And when, when he finally got to the other side of the river and, and the weaker student crawled up the bank of the river he looked back and his friend was gone with the current in the river and he died he drowned what gift did he give him he gave him life no greater love is there than this except a man lay down his life for his friends Jesus laid down his life for you. I don't tell that story to, to, to poke your emotions. I tell you that story so that you'll realize what Jesus did for us. Don't take it lightly. When you leave this place, it's not a check in the box. I, I went to church. Yay. No, go out there and live Jesus to your family and your friends. Okay? If you don't know Jesus, let us introduce you to him. All righty? You need to know Jesus. You need to know what he's done for you. All righty? Pray with me. God, thank you for today. Thank you, God. The, the message of your word is so clear. It's so real. It's alive. And God, we can know it and we can live it. God, help us to do so. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.